Okay. Okay, I'm ready to start. I hope you are too. Let's get started. Um, so building up your literature review, tools for historians. I um, I thought about this session that is new. I, I made it all from scratch. It's the first time I, I'm trying this. So as I said, uh, if you want to uh, uh, have a say and uh, and interrupt me, please do. Um, I probably don't see very well the um, uh, the chat, the, the you know the messages that pop up in the chat. But there is also a colleague of mine online. So, Mary, if you uh, if you feel like I should answer you know a question, uh, please <laughs> open your mic and let me know. Um, I gave a few trainings in the in the first semester. And I realized that we have lots of bibliographical databases that are not very much used. I talked to some professors, they told me they point you in the direction of, uh, of these bibliographical databases, uh, but probably not enough. Uh, and they're very, very powerful tools. And, um, and so I, this is how I, I started thinking about this session. But on top of that, uh, there are also things that we librarians do every day um dealing with uh, metadata and uh, you know subject headings we'll see later what i mean that i thought would be useful if you're starting a, a literature review if you start if you are investigating a topic from scratch and um and i thought i would share them with you uh because it, it feels like we do a lot of effort to um in the, not not just us in in our library but all the, the librarians in the world to um provide good metadata for uh the material that, that that we have that we buy that we purchase and then uh sometimes uh all this work is not put to use and it's it's a waste so i'm trying to spread the word so let's get started. And what we're going to see today, basically, is uh, the bibliographical process as a whole. Um, I know it can be very intimidating and quite depressing sometimes. <laughs> and so I, I just want to reassure you and, and show you that uh, it's it's kind of logical if you, if you follow some easy steps. And then some of the techniques to build a, lit a literature review. The first one is citation chaining and then uh, search uh, searches in library catalogs. Um, history databases, as I said, we have lots of bibliographical databases that are very useful. Other databases uh, in, in case uh, you need them. Actually, I left out one of the points because I added it and, and last, last night, um, print bibliographies. I will let this do my presentation when I share it as a PDF. And, um, um, and some search techniques throughout these categories because, yeah, I thought that some um actually some some of the methods that are not known to the to the big public let's say uh can turn out to be useful when you're looking uh, especially into databases they have their own languages so if you learn a trick or two you uh, can make the most of them uh as i said uh i i will start with uh, the bibliographical process as a whole um, because I, you know, I've been there and I know that when you are investigating a new topic, you have to write a literature review, it can be daunting. And, uh, you know, you start the day with lots of problems and, and then you have lots of problems with, a, you know, on a spreadsheet, you feel like you don't, you don't make any progress. So this is my, I always, I always say this during my presentations, I make excuses for what I'm going to explain in a minute, uh, but uh, this is why I'm, I'm, I'm about to do what I, um, uh, what I'm, what I'm about to do. So I, I would like to explain uh, briefly the, the bibliographical process as a whole, so that you can have, um, you can feel better about it. <laughs> that's all, that's all. So I I took as a as a guide the excellent uh, seven pillars of not not of wisdom but the seven pillars of information literacy provided by the uh, Librarians Association in the UK. Um, basically, anytime you look for information and then you put your, this information to use, you go through these stages, and 
uh, doing a, um, you know, searching for a, a, or doing writing actually a um, literature review is no exception. So you will I, uh, you will uh, you will go through these seven phases, uh, of which the most important if, for this presentation is the fourth, the one in the middle to gather. So when you um, download and accumulate all these uh, articles and book chapters that are eventually be um, going to be part of your literature review. Um, but just very briefly, uh, if you, as I said, if you think about this process as uh, systematic and a tidy, uh, you know, methodic process, process, then uh, it will feel less daunting. This is at least how I feel about it. So if you identify the topic precisely in the subtopics and, and just uh, give yourself yourself precise limits to what you want to find. That's a, already a very important step, so you don't get drown you don't drown in uh, information. List and this is very important for your searches for the for, you know for the step number four. List keywords, especially if you're using languages that are not native uh, to you. Um, uh, yeah, most of you will look into uh, English, you know, um, uh, bibliographies and, uh, you know, in, in the English language, but occasionally some of you might go into, you know, Italian bibliographies or French bibliographies. Maybe you're not, you're, you're very good at these languages, but uh, you need to define very precisely what the words are for those topics. And that's super important then to find the right material, the material that you need. Uh, scope, uh, based on point number one, assess what you already have. You probably already have something. You must have a handbook or uh, or some article that you, you know, you have a PhD topic and, and you uh, and you started from some, yeah, from somebody else's idea to develop your own idea. So you can start from there. And and then identify the gaps that you need to fill. Of course, this process this is the, the the objective of a literature review. Identify the gaps. So you will probably need to come back to this point later on, but do it from the very beginning so that you don't, as I said, you don't drown in information um, when uh, when you feel like you have too much. Um, then plan. So what are the tools that suit your needs? Uh, we're going. To, through these tools, as I said today, citation chaining, Google Scholar, print bibliographies, the catalog, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Once you have an idea of uh, of what what kind of topics you want to develop, then um, you might want to go into sources that are not uh, maybe the ones that I mentioned today. Uh, you know of a library, and this happens to me. Um, relatively often, you know, when, when I'm, I'm going through this process, you, you want to look into the catalog of a library somewhere else in the world, a library you don't have access to, but you have access on the, on the online catalog. And, and, you, and you go there because you know that this library is very, very good at um, holding uh, material about your topic. For instance, this is, this is the first thing that comes to mind. But then you might know databases that I don't know. I'm sure you do because I have very limited knowledge of, um, uh, yeah, human knowledge. So, uh, yeah, just in this phase, decide what are the tools that you need, and you can always go back and uh, and look somewhere else uh, if you need to. Then, uh, as I said, the uh, the point that we're going to develop today is gather. You look into bibliographical tools. You get hold as, uh, of as many interesting items as possible. Uh, don't forget that uh, on top of normal bibliography, uh, you also have blog posts, websites, podcasts. If needed, you have lots of, um, in, in, in the case of history, uh, I know that there is some SPS um, people around, or they, they, uh, at least they registered for the session. But in case of uh, history, there, there's lots of um, projects in digital humanities. They have a website, you might want to uh, quote the website and use the website in your bibliography, why not? This is something that you have to see with your supervisor, obviously, but don't forget that there's, you know, there is a whole digital world out there that you can, um, they can exploit. And uh, evaluate, 
So once you gathered everything, you don't have to read everything. There is a further step. And then maybe you take it a little bit at a time. You, I don't know, you have 50 articles waiting there. What you want to do is not read them all uh, because, you know, it's a, it's a huge task. You want to read the abstracts and make a selection. So uh, this is another um, thing that you have to ponder when you, when you, when you do bibliographical search. You don't have to read everything. Uh, just feel free to, you know, read just abstracts and get rid forever of anything you don't need. Uh, you will be you will be reading the whole thing later, uh, maybe not even the whole thing, um, de depending on what kind of material you have. But uh, just try to be, as I said, methodical about this because then you don't waste time. So this is at least my advice and then the last two steps we have manage and of course i recommend uh any citation management software and in particular zotero you know that we have a special zotero agreement here at dui and this is what we support you with um and there's there's going to be another session if you never open zotero and you don't know where to start from we have a session for beginners in about a month uh, I'll, but I'll be happy to, if you have any question, just email me and I'll be happy to help. Uh, this is how you manage your bibliography. So you have, you know, when you eventually decide what to keep, you start having a tidy place where you put all your references and possibly your files as well. So you can find them easily. They're not in any random um, folder in your computer. And then finally present is when you get down to writing. So you present the um, the results of your search. Um, so moving on to the first method, uh, which is citation chaining. Um, this is something I, I've, I've been doing a lot. So I, I know you can go down a rabbit hole, as I say at the bottom of the slide. Um, you... Um, what, what, what do you do? You, as I said earlier, you probably have uh, something already in your bibliography that that inspired you to open up um, um, a chosen topic. Uh, but if you don't, or if you need more, you want to go to the library catalog, for instance, that would be my first thought, and look for a handbook, some kind of authoritative source, some kind of, um, well, a handbook is more like a pedagogical tool, uh, something that tells you where to find other kind of other information on some specific topics. So that, this, that's an excellent place where to start. So I, I recently had a, a question about uh, history of health and I'm not going into the, the specifics, but I thought it would, would be a good example to um, to look for um, uh, something about women and medicine in early modern France. It could be anything else. In this case, I would go into the library catalog and look for medicine and handbook, for instance. Uh, the first um, uh, medicine is the first keyword that popped into my mind. And uh, I would look at the bibliography um, of a couple of chapters in the Oxford Handbook of the History of Medicine. Sounds authoritative enough, you know, you have the Oxford Handbooks, the Cambridge Handbooks, the Palgrave, uh, Springer, wh whatever. Uh, but usually if there's handbook in the title, then it's, you know, it's always a good source. And then look into the specific chapters and see how they're developed, possibly read them because they're going to be useful anyway, um, and see, what they quote in their bibliography and start from there. And then, well, I have another example, the Pargrave Handbook of Women and Science, et cetera. And then you follow the chain. So from authoritative articles, who are, uh, you, I'm sure you can assess and evaluate whether um, 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 a particular article or book chapter you're reading is fundamental in the uh, history of your topic, if somebody else already, uh, you know, researched it, and then you follow the chain, and then at some point you stop because, as I said, you don't want to go down a rabbit hole, and um, this this could go on forever and ever. Stop at some point, and and stick to the um, to the sources that sound authoritative, as I said. And then you can, you know, when, when you have a, um, a good overview, just stop and move on to other methods. So then you're, you're sure that you're not leaving anything out. Going into library catalogs, uh, I'm going to state the obvious here, 
uh but maybe maybe some things are not as obvious as you think so um in any library catalog including ours and you have a nice screenshot here on the um on the right of of the column that you find on the left so it's, it's a bit confusing but i'm sure you know our ca library catalog very well um my advice it's obviously make use of the facets available this as i said this column here uh this one is, is my mouse yes visible um you can uh sift through electronic resources books uh, ebook or well, electronic resources are also ebooks uh, but if you find something else called continuing resources it means that um, you have journals as well if you don't need journals like journal titles at that point you can leave them out through these facets mm, so the facets are these filters on on um, uh, on the side of the screen that you can use to uh, um go through your results uh you can use the subjects the language etc so make use of those uh make use of the advanced search uh let me open it for you so you if you never used it um it's quite of course uh useful um you can uh have well, th these are standard features of any catalog, but they're made very, very easy here in in the um, in our catalog specifically. So you can choose uh, to have all a uh, set of keywords, the exact phrase, unwanted terms, um, format types. As I said, you can you can also filter later through the facets, um, etc. This is especially good to eliminate the noise. So when when we talk about the noise in uh, in search results, we mean all those uh, articles and book chapters, etc., that pop up that are not related to what really what you're looking for, but uh, have some kind of keyword in common, so they 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 come up anyway. So the more limitations you give to your uh, research uh, to your search, then uh, the less noise you get. If you give too many limitations, then you don't get results, but that's another problem. Um, so you have to find a balance, but uh, make use of quotes. And this is something um, uh, I noticed that some sometimes people don't know or don't, don't do because they forget about it. Uh, as, uh, again, it's very obvious, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Uh, the power of quotes. So when you, when you insert quotes, um, in any catalog nowadays, um, not just our library catalog, but also Google, Google Scholar, and uh, uh, other databases, the quotes uh, around expressions um, will give you precise results for that expression. So in, I, I just used birth control um, in our catalog, and it gave me 201 res results. And, and if I put it in, into quotes, so the, the exact phrase birth control and not just the word birth and the, just the word control in the same uh, record, uh, it gave me 161 results, which is still a lot uh, to sift through, but I have 40 results less. And I have the absolute certainty that I have all the material that contains the, 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 the sentence birth control. Uh, in in the library in this case, um, very very useful. But we'll, we'll see more later. Um, further library search tips. I, I might get too excited now because this is um, this is something very um, connected to the, to the job of the librarians. But uh, get to know the library classification. Whether you are in our library or in another library, uh, you if you know a little bit the library classification, or at least you know where to find your topics in, and you know the uh, the letters that mark the books that uh, you're looking at, and then they go to the shelf. On the shelf, you might find more stuff that you find on the catalog. Um, so it's always a good, uh, it's always a good thing to browse the shelves physically, and you can also do reverse searches. Um, so what I mean, I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, but if you if you want to look into Dewey, I'm I'm sure that some of you came to some of my sessions in the past. This is what I mean. This is uh, um, the uh, the Dewey uh, classification. In a nutshell, really, this this website, which is linked to the presentation, 
and and I'm I'm going to email it to you later, so don't worry. Um, it's very nice because you can browse it um very easily. So if you if you click on these classes as they're called, you can go further and further down and see uh, whether, you know, wh where your topic is, for instance. So if we go into nine, it's history and geography. Um, this is the obvious example for historians. So let's go to, I don't know, 946, which is Spain and Iberian Peninsula. And then, um, I don't know, let's go into Portugal. 946.9, then you don't see it from here, but it will probably, the, the Jewish classification, all these other numbers will mean a specific time period, let's say, in the history of Portugal. But then if you if you go into the library catalog, you can do this. So the classification for Portugal is 946.9, history of Portugal. So you go to the library catalog, you can do this kind of reverse search by Dewey number, Nine four six point nine. Search. I we've got one hundred and forty one results for the history of Portugal. This is a very wide topic, so it's nothing too exciting. Um, but the the nice thing is that in this way you also get lots of uh, electronic material that is classified as well. But it's not obviously it's not on the shelf because it's not doesn't have a physical. Um, um, book to look at, but uh, in this way you can also kind of fill the gaps and and see what we have electronically, at least in the in the in the realm of of books and ebooks. So remember, with this you can do all sorts of reverse um, uh, searches, which is very interesting. Like I, I call them reverse because we usually look for the title or the author, and then but you, you can do the opposite. So uh, this is um. This is a, a, a nice way to work through in into the material of a library instead of you know looking for keywords and, and thinking oh there is nothing here there might be more if you if you look a little bit more carefully um, and then my other if you feel nerdy but <laughs> but you know this is a skill for life I think uh, you can look into subject headings so subject headings are the librarian's way to assign control keywords to books. Uh, and I say controlled because they're always, we, we, we try to give them always the same uh, keywords uh, and we try to agree on them, even though sometimes this poses problems like, uh, you know, well, the, the biggest problem is bias because I, I might think of something in, in another way um, or in an opposite way as of uh, a person on the other side of the world or, or you know, of a gender different from mine or race different from mine, etc. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we try to do our best. The Library of Congress subject headings, this is how they're called, are used by Anglophone libraries. So bear this in mind. There are, obviously, this all depends on the language that you're using. So the, the French might have another system and the Italians have another system. I know that for sure. Um, which is, well, it's all similar, but um, in in different languages. Uh, but the logic is, is similar. So if you if you're looking for as as I said, if you're working with uh, with lots of uh, French material, Italian material, whatever, um, try to Google uh, the uh, the kind of classification not 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 the classification, but the the subjects that this these countries, the association of librarians, because every country has one, um, tend to use, and this will be very useful. Um, so how is your subject, the, the, the question is, how is your subject named by the Library of Congress? In this case, if you're working on English material, you go, uh, there are several websites. I usually go on this one where I search authorities. So an authority is a, um, is a subject heading. Well, it's, it's not, but let me, let me make it very simple. Um, that is being authorized by the Library of Congress. So it's officially, it's, it's a list of official expressions used uh, to, um, um, to provide metadata for a book. Uh, let me, I've prepared an example here. I'm sorry, I, I'll, try, I'll do this again, okay. So um, you go here, you leave, you leave on subject authority headings. Uh, then you know, if you're curious, <laughs> one day I, I can tell you what these other things are, but not for the moment. 
Um, and then, oh yes, I wanted to look for. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, here on the uh, on the left two kinds of red buttons. Let's say the authorized headings. So you've seen birth control is the official expression for birth control, so that's easy. Um, if I scroll down, um, this is this made me smile yesterday. Uh, birth control and astrology might be a subject, why not? Um, but it's not named like this because it, it redirects me to a reference, let's see. And it says, um, it's, it basically says, listen, um, this is not how we call it. We call it astrology and birth control. <laughs> okay. So then you follow the links, you go to the uh, authority record. So this is the difference. So an authorized heading is this one. You don't need, you don't even need to click on this because it gives you information that you don't need. And then um, when, when you find references, then you follow um, either, either one of the links and see what's the authorized heading in, in which case, in this case is astrology and birth control. Um, but then if I, um, if you don't want to use this tool, you can even see what kind of um, subject headings are already present in the library. You want to like, if you don't want to search on another website, again, uh, you can see what existing subject headings we use at the library. They're authorized anyway by the Library of Congress. So no, no worries about that. If, if I, and I wanted to show you if you, um, if you don't find enough material on our catalog and you want to see, uh, um, you want to expand your bibliography and use a website like WorldCat, which I've uh, I mentioned in, in other sessions a few times, um, uh, it's a very wide um, catalog that uh, encompasses lots and lots of libraries around the world. Uh, but you don't know how to look for a subject. You can also use our catalog, for instance, to look for a topic. As I said, I wanted to look into Medicine France. Uh -huh. And maybe also... It will make sense in a second, bear with me. So you go into any record that um, resembles something that you might be interested in and then look into the subject terms. These are already, have already been validated by a librarian. So you just take it, uh, you copy it. And then as you see, let's see how many results it gave me. It gave me four results for medicine, Fran for medicine France history women. So not much. And you want to see what's out there. You go to work at, and, uh, and in the advanced search, this is what I was forgetting. You, you do a research by subject. You paste the subject, possibly eliminate the hyphens because they might interfere or they do interfere because I tried this yesterday. And and then you've got the the books that have this specific subject. So Medicine, France, History, 16th Century. Um, and and they're all very, very, very interesting. So it's it's a very good way to search. This is why I um I wanted to tell you about subject headings. If um if you uh pay attention, you will notice that subject headings are um sorry, are uh, modular. So they are uh, made in a way that um, uh, they start from uh, uh, the main subject. So in this case, it's, sub, uh, it's birth control. Then you add the country, France. Then, and then you, that, that is already a, a subject heading. But then if you want to be more specific, you add history. If you want to be even more specific, you add 20th century or 16th century, whatever. Um, so you can have a very long subject headings or a very short one depending and, and then you choose obviously uh, based on what you need. So I think it's a it's a very good way to find books, um, especially in big, big catalogs like WorldCat. Um, moving on, stop me if you have questions. Eh? I'll, I'll just carry on 
talking to myself in this room where I'm alone. Um, bibliographical databases, finally something more uh, juicy. Uh, the bibliographical databases that we have at the UI are listed on this web page that I'm sure you've seen because I show it, I show it to you in other sessions. Um, I, you know, I created a section about databases and e-resources and in this section, a subsection about bibliographical databases. So bibli databases only devoted to bibliographies and to bibli not to bibliographies, but to their function is that of letting you find um, new uh, literature. Uh, so they're all listed here. Um, so again, it's all on the website, Don. Uh, don't write notes and just uh, relax. They could link the bibliographical databases. Uh, I'll call like this because they could they could link to the full text, and many times they do, um, but not necessarily. So um, you know we're very much used to linking through and find the the, the the full text all the time. In this case, it might not happen because bibliographical the, the main function of bibliogra bibliographical databases is not to lead you to the full text, is to give you references. So um, sometimes they just don't. Um, and then if they if they only give you the citation, then you have to find the article or the book chapter on your own. Um, um, so you, you just go back to the library catalog first, the DUI library catalog, see if we have the journal, the book. If we don't, you ask for interlibrary loan, you ask me to purchase whatever, etc. cetera. So uh, since we've clarified the, the function, I can go into the core databases for history that we have here. We have um, historical abstracts with full text and America history and life with full text. Uh, those are complementary, as you can imagine. They, they're from the same source, it's called EBSCO. And one doesn't have uh, the history of US and Canada and the other one does. So just, just bear this in mind. Uh, they look exactly the same. So I'll just open one and show it to you. It's, ooh, okay, sorry. Um, then I connect to database. This is by far, I think, the, the most useful database that we have uh, for history at the UI, uh, for bi bibliographical uh, research, obviously, um, because it, in this um, first home that leads you to the landing page, so the, 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 the searches that you can do are very, very clear, very easy, super, uh, I, I find it super user friendly. So um, in these fields, you uh, you put your search terms. You can choose a field where you want to put them. And there are so many. Just don't go crazy because then otherwise it won't give you many results. Uh, so I, you start at least start from all text. And then if you realize that you get too many results, uh, pass on to uh, abstract, for instance. Maybe it's um, uh, it's it's a good way. So So just... Just be careful and uh, and ease into the use of these databases. Um, you can find oh these are um, I'm going to explain you in a second what these are the the gold uh, um, boolean operators um, and they're quite easy to use no no worries um, you can. See, you have search modes here. You have I. I would always stick one the full. Not no, sorry, not the full text, but the peer review. Where is the peer review button? Because you want, uh, well, at least to start with, you want, um, uh, to collect um academic um material. Obviously, then you might leave it out and and see what happens. Um. If you want to limit to full text, do, but then you won't have all the uh, citations that you need. Um, um, it's This is very nice. Uh, you can choose the historical period where, of course, this goes into the topic of your, uh, into the subject of your, of what you're looking for and not the publication date. So we have, um, this is why I like it because you can limit it to, uh, you don't have to write early modern, but you can, uh, you can just, do something like this and have sort of an early modern uh, period defined by dates. Um, and then you can also sift through publication dates if you uh, if you want to. 
um, yeah, you have publication type. Um, this is something uh, that is um, it's very much used in social sciences more than I think in humanities. Um, bibliography. Uh, sometimes people, oh, um, academics write like the bibliography of a certain subject uh, and publish it as an article. So if you're very lucky, you might have, you know, your literature review kind of done by somebody else or at least part of it. So uh, look into that sometimes if you if you want, I'll leave it out for the moment. Um, there are also images in here, or you can also select the language. This um, this database comprises lots and lots and lots and lots of journals in different languages. So you can also do searches in languages that are not English. Um, let's try to do a little search. You have to always put um, this is this says it's optional, but I found that if if you if you don't put it doesn't give you much uh, as a result. So uh, I will just go medicine and women and France. So I'll just try this out um, with this historical period. So it's already kind of early modern. I don't, I don't, I don't want to specify it in my search terms. And then I hit the search, and I and remember I I, um, I only selected peer-reviewed material. I have 152, which is a lot, but it's not bad. You know, sometimes you get like a thousand, and, and then it gets it gets difficult. Um, but you can further refine your um uh, your uh, your your search results here in the facets on the left, for instance. Here we go. We've got, uh, well, the, the subjects that look quite different from those used by librarians, but uh, the, the, they're also easier to use. The, we have publications listed, uh, journal titles. Well, you we have languages and publishers. I, I, I think it's a, uh, it's a very nice database, uh, but you can do even more with this. And I would like to uh, tell you, let's see what the time is, because I might then talk too much, but we have time. Um, what Boolean operators are, and Boolean operators, you can use them in historical abstracts, uh, so this database, uh, but also we'll see later in basically all the bibliographical databases that you uh, you, you might use. Um, you might have heard of them or seen them. Um, I, I just list the, the you know the, the most uh, useful and, and 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 the easiest functions which are um this three and or or not uh if you write uh, these boolean operators in your search in capital letters the database might find it easier to understand <laughs> that you you mean a boolean operator and not uh, a, a simple word so if you use and, you tell the database that all the search terms must be present in the resulting records. So um, like in my example, I had women and medicine and France. I want everything to be present. If you use or, uh, you broaden your research, telling the database that any of your search terms can be present in the resulting records. So for example, if you have similar terms for the same thing, uh, you tell the database, sorry, that you want Oh my, sorry. <laughs> you want contraception or pill or birth control. So you're telling the database, you know, I just I just want to know something about um contraception. In in this in this general terms, I don't care which kind of contraception you, you give me, <laughs> but as long as uh, as long as you put it in the search. And if you use not, obviously you exclude words from your research, you eliminate noise, as I as I said. So um uh, cloning not sheep uh, because then you you might get too many results that uh, also have the word sheep and you and you don't want to know about sheep. Um, Boolean operators are more efficient uh, if you isolate expressions in quotes uh, and I, I mentioned quotes earlier. Uh, you can combine these things with uh, with quotes and something else which is super useful, I, I love uh, using wildcards, uh, are um, uh, characters that you can use 
uh, instead of letters. And you can combine them with Boolean operators and make some very sophisticated searches. So if you use asterisk or um, all the question mark wildcards, um, you can replace multiple characters. Uh, you just don't use the question mark at the end of words uh, because you can use only the asterisk at the end of words. So like if you see in the in the in 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 the example that I give you below, if you type a uh, woman with an asterisk or with a, with a question mark, in this case, they're equivalent, you will look for both women and women. Uh, if you look for medic uh, with an asterisk, and uh, you cannot use a question mark here, um, you the database will look for medic, medics, medicine, medicines, medical, etc., and things that I, um, I, I couldn't think about yesterday. Um, you, the reason why you have two is that you can combine them. So you can, in the same word, you can use an asterisk uh, maybe at the end of the word if you need to, and a question mark. The hash wild uh, wildcard uh, can be used where an alternate spelling might contain an extra character. So, uh, well, uh, I give you the example of color or uh, pediatric. So, um, but you know, I, I mainly use uh, uh, asterisks and question marks. Um, so let me go back to um, to this search. You'll see what changes. But the nice thing about um, uh, this database it, it, it is that it also suggests uh, some some of these things already. So. Um, here you're using Boolean operators suggested by the database medicine or medical or health, or you can also do this medic with an, ast with an asterisk. Sorry, my keyboard is playing up a bit. I can do this, huh? Yes. Uh, or health. So I'm, I'm using a wildcard and a Boolean operator. So I, I'm telling the database either, you know, medicine or health, either terms are, are fine with me. And then um, I also want to use, bear with me, I'm really sorry. I don't know why it's not doing what I'm telling. Here we go. <laughs> okay. And let's see how the, see, I've got now 284 result, the results. So I've got more than, almost double because I broadened the search. Uh, oh, something else that I could have done here is, or a female. You see, but you've got lots and lots of other options. Oh, and maybe, um, I don't know. I can include a search with inverted uh, commas or quotes. Uh, this doesn't make much sense, but 314. So I expanded my um, my results further. So this is how you can use uh, Boolean operators, uh, which are also included here. If you like, as I said earlier, uh, this is something that is embedded in in the in this search, um, and wildcards and quotes together. Um, this is super useful when you practice it a little bit. Um, going further into our um our tools you can also do proximity searches uh so uh, we, you have the near operator finds the words if they are uh, a minimum of five words in this case because you put the number five apart from one another uh this is something even more sophisticated or the within finds the words if they are within eight words of one another in the order in which you enter them so it's uh, this is the difference between the two um, I'm not going to show you this, but because I think it's clear enough. But you know, if you if you need to perform very uh, uh, again sophisticated searches, you also have this option. Um, going again uh, more into uh, core databases for history, we have periodical archives online and periodical index online. They're very similar. One has uh, access to full text; the other one uh, gives you citations. 
they're from the same company. So again, which is called ProQuest. And again, I'll show you one of the two because they're basically the same. Mm -hmm. And it might ask you where you come from. And uh, of course we select European University Institute. Mm -hmm. And um, you get the same. The uh, interface is a bit, a bit less friendly, uh, I find, than historical abstracts. You can do advanced searches, which are more helpful. You see, you have the same uh, kind of uh, options, uh, not as many, but still kind of useful. Um, the, um, the special thing that ProQuest gives you is the command line, which is Again, a way to, to combine everything you know about Boolean operators, wildcards, and brackets. So you, you uh, add another level of difficulty. Um, the command line search is uh, it's not very easy. You have to practice it. Uh, you have to like it. <laughs> Otherwise, just you know, search in another way. The advanced search is fine. But I just wanted, wanted to show you how it looks like if you if you feel like it. Uh, so it's designed to help you build a precise search using operators to combine different fields, uh, especially useful in databases, maybe not periodicals uh, online, but there are um, databases out there with um, you know, an enormous amount of information and you really have to know how to look for what you, what you want. So this, this becomes very useful. Um, we, let me, I, I wanted to copy this, but I have to get out of the presentation. Mm -hmm. This one. I know it's easy, I prepared it yesterday, so I'm not improvising, but um, you can also use, you know, when, when you build a command line, you can you can make use of, uh, of the help that the database gives you. So this, um, inserts automatically the operators or the field where you want to look. Uh, in this case, I had one ready. So in, um, I want something that has to do with medicine, medical, whatever, or health. And I isolate these two um, terms uh, in brackets so that the database knows that the alternatives are between those two and not you know, the rest of the expression. And as a Boolean operator, because I want, you know, once I've taken care of, of medicine, I want uh, the database to uh, give me something about women. So one question mark and or female. And and then eventually my uh, time period. So early modern France. And I put it into um, quotes to be more precise. Um, Oh, I forgot to tick peer reviewed, but I can do it later. It's no, it's no problem, but I've got 50 results. Again, quite a good result, uh, not too much. Uh, it's quite little if um, if nothing, but I can always modify this early modern France and look for other expressions uh, that are equivalent. Um, so this is how the command line works. Uh, it took me a long time to figure it out. As I said, you know, if you if you feel like you can mm, spend some time, go for it. Otherwise, just just use the tools that are provided by the databases, um, and I'm sure you'll be fine. So I'll um, I'll just drink a sip of water before I go on to the next. Okay. Um, and this was ProQuest. More UI databases. So um, we have more because we, you know, we we also um, deal with other disciplines than history. But um, I thought I would show you, uh, even though they have less history and historical sources, uh, because the databases that I show you, especially periodical archives online, have um, historical journals. Uh, or some um, some historic periodical archives online also has newspapers historical newspapers, um, um, you know journals from the nineteenth century the twentieth century. Uh, uh, unlike other disciplines, we historians need this kind of old source uh, most of the times. 
Um, so these other databases are more have recent stuff um, and uh, they're more focused on, on the present or, or recent years. Uh, but um, you have good tools for um, uh, broader searches. Uh, sometimes you need to look into uh, topics that are more um, pertain more to social sciences than humanities. Uh, and and so like you're in the right place at the UI, at least we have the, the tools. Uh, author searches uh, and cited references searches. I'll, I'll show you what I mean, especially with Web of Science. Web of Science is, I think, the most powerful database, bibliographical database we have at the UI. So historical abstracts is the best for history, but this is, I think, the most powerful. Might see, you might, it might not work on Chrome sometimes. So let me open Firefox. I don't know why it does this to me, but there is an easy fix. Oh, something that I forgot to mention is that uh, in historical abstracts, in periodical archives online, and also in Web of Science, you can create your own account and save searches so you don't have to repeat them. Like if, if it happens that you create a very good command line and you're very proud of it, you don't have to uh, jot it down somewhere. You can save it into your own account on that database. So this is also very, uh, very good. And, and also in Web of Science, you can create your own um, your own account and be identified as an author. This is something I, I did yesterday for the first time. Uh, so you can you can say, you know, this this publication is mine and it goes on to my profile. Um, I wanted to show you Web of Science uh, for some functions that other databases don't give you or don't give you in, in, in as well. Um, if you identify somebody who um, has published widely in the topic that you're interested in and you want to check out the whole um, bibliography uh, and you might go onto their profile, uh, their university, but you know they might have changed several universities, so you don't know whether you're looking at the whole list of the publications. You can come to Web of Science and, and search uh, here. And Web of Science, as I said, is one of the most comprehensive databases for this kind of search. Yep. Okay. And then you can also add a name variance. And it gives you, you see, like two profiles, but it's the same person as we know. Um, so it's like, uh, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't quite know that it's two, it, it's the same person, but as I said, we, we do, and you can look into uh into the first, you can or you can select both and view as combined record. But in this case, I'll just click on the first one. And it gives me everything. It gives me also some uh, statistics like the age index and uh, uh, how many people uh, um, quoted uh, his articles and book chapters and books, etc. Uh, if if you're interested, but you know the most important thing is that it gives you uh, this kind of list. Uh, and then I just wanted to show you something else. So when you when you go to this other tab, documents, um, well, you can do the the document search, which is what we've done so far. So you um, again, you can search in fields for keywords, and uh, it does the, you know the the same old thing we we've, we've seen uh, everywhere, but it. You can also do a reverse search and see, and this is also useful sometimes uh, when you want to see where a certain article has been uh, cited. Um, so for example, yeah, sorry, I did the search yesterday, so it pops up. So we've got a book by Giorgio Riello, Cotton, the fabric that made, that made the modern world. Who quoted it? So uh, we've got 20 results. We can select them all, see them. And some of these might be very useful for our uh, bibliographical search. Some may not be. Um, but you know, you, you can also explore bibliographies in this way. And as I said, Web of Science is one of the best for this kind of search. Um, we also have... Uh, 
in Genta Connect. I'm not going to show you much of this because it's not very historical, but you have to know that it exists. And oh yeah, this one gives me the same problem as Web of Science. So I'll move on to Firefox. Should work a bit better. And you see you have same old um, kind of structure to look for articles uh, and uh, another kind of material. Um, yeah, I'll leave it up to you because as I said, I don't, I don't want to keep you here forever. And I was hoping to finish before half past three. So I'll leave this to you. As I said, you know, the historical databases are others. Um, Moving on to uh, other databases, uh, we have, uh, don't forget that we have national bibliographies. So national bibliography is a systematic bibliography of acquisitions of a national library. Uh, many places in the world have this law, like it, it, it happens in Italy, happens in the UK, happens in France. And when you publish a book, when you're a publisher and you publish a book, uh, you have to give a copy to your national library um, or to the national deposit of, of publications. It happens here in, in Florence and Rome. Um, those are the two national libraries of Italy. Um, and, and the libraries make lists of what they received. So it's a, it's sort of a comprehensive list of what was published in in a country in in um, in a set year. Uh, you you can also have national bibliographies that only deal with history, depending on how organized the library is. Uh, I put some of the most important national bibliographies on this web page. So again, no worries. It's all it's all here. Some um, well, most of the European countries now have them online and they are free to consult. So this is a very this is very easy. Um, some of them are still on CD-ROM, um, so there's there's no, there is no access online. Some of them uh, are behind a paywall, like the uh, UK one. But uh, you know, for most most of them, this is something very easy to to do. Unless then you you want to look at some um, old year, like I don't know, you go back to the nineteen nineties, the nineteen eighties, and see what was published back then. Then you have to look for the paper version of this. We might have it in the library. Where we might not have it in the library. It depends. Um, but just bear in mind that this kind of bibliographies exist so if you want to do a you know an over, if you want an overview of um of what was published in a country in a determined period of time this is an excellent place uh where to start um then we've got um well lots of bibliographical databases about specific things uh, such as um, these are um, I listed here some of uh, our subscriptions like the Central and European Online Library, uh, CEOL, as it, as we call it, uh, that focuses on Eastern Europe. It's an excellent database. People who run it are very nice. <laughs> we uh, we have a very long history with them. Um, and again, this my oh, it, most of the times this also leads you to the full text. So uh, they really do an excellent work with all of those countries that are not usually covered by big databases, uh, so, you know, such as, as the Balkans, Romania, and Ukraine, etc. This is um, a very, very interesting database if you work on Eastern Europe. Um, I'll give you another uh, example of this German database. Uh, again, with full text of, of over 700 scholarly German journals uh, in the humanities. Um, you probably, the Germans among you already know this, but we subscribe to it. And then we have another, uh, you know, about a specific subject we have, uh, as an example, uh, Econlit, about econ economic literature, and it's also his historic. 
so if if you do um history of, of economics in 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 any you know subfield then this is a very good place to start my colleague thomas burke knows this uh this database very well it can help and uh then i i took this french one we don't subscribe to because it's free but it's also you know uh if if you're looking into um um french uh, particular um, bibliography then this might be the best place where to start because you know it's it's all in french and it's run by oh and it's run by um yeah the french government so um I guess my my message here is, well, these these are just examples that are listed on our website. Um, start from Google <laughs> and and if, if trying to find out if there is a specific uh, bibliographical database for your subject. Uh, some of them we might not have. You might have to go to another library, but you know it's uh, it's it's very useful if you find. As I said, a, a database that only deals with your sub subject specifically. We had a trial last December that I set up um, um, for early modern material, which was called Eater Bibliography. I got no answer, so I couldn't subscribe to it. Uh, but that in that case, they have it at Itakti Library, and it's a very useful database for early modern history, and it has a very broad range of languages, uh, so not just English, but uh, yeah, any kind of European language. Um, so that, that is very useful for that time period. Uh, I'm about to finish, so I'll, I'll go into the last uh, couple of things. Google Scholar, uh, which was the obvious choice. I'm, I'm sure that is the, is the first place where everybody goes, and also I go. The So I'm, I'm not going too much into it. I just want to say use quote search uh here again because it's uh you know it's very helpful when you when you're looking uh for something specific use boolean operators because google scholar does support this function now that you know what they are um uh, advanced uh, this I, I misspelled the advanced search option there is an advanced search option in google scholar that is very useful make use of it because uh, as you know when you when you type in something to google scholar it gives you a, a million results um and then the most useful tip that i can give you is that you can have um direct links to full text based on the library that you are part of. So what I mean is, and I'll show you very quickly, if you go to Google Scholar, and this is my profile, as you can see, it's me. Um, if you go into settings here, where, where the three lines are, and you go to library links, you can add um, the libraries that you are affiliated to. So in this case, we have European University Institute. Um, but, you know, if you look, it should give me the result anyway, right? No, it doesn't, because I already have it. Um, Here we go, Università di Firenze, and then you tick it, and then, well, I'll, I'll, I'll unselect it now because I'm, I don't have access to the material through the Università di Firenze. These are my three libraries of choice. Um, and then when you, um, if you do this and you save, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you do any kind of search, sorry, I just have to, to think off the top of my head. Then uh, you see here on the on the right, you have listed the, um, the place where you can find the full text. Sometimes you have the full text because it's something that is open access or uh, it's just available on the web. And then you've got UI links. So uh, in this journal called Public We possibly, I guess, subscribe to public understanding of science. And I click on EY links and it links me through the full text 
uh, or it should. <laughs> now I, I should report an access problem, but of course I'm doing this live and it didn't work, but I promise that it usually does. Uh, I didn't pick a good topic. So let me let me try again so you see when it actually works. This was a former um, professor at the UI. So I'm sure we have, no, I'm sorry. It's not working today <laughs> from my laptop at least, but probably should do this on Firefox. The The reason I know why this is happening is because my Zotero is, is messing up with, um, uh, yeah, with the proxy links, but never mind. It's just my laptop. It's not, it's not a problem of of Google Scholar. I promised it works. Um, this, yeah, these are the main tips um, that I can give you about Google Scholar. And to conclude, um, print bibliographies. So we've looked far and wide online. Uh, but we have the gold, uh, the, the old good books <laughs> and the, the, the books that are bibliographies. So lists of other books in the form of books. Is there anything better? So we have uh, bibliographies in print. Of course, they are probably oldish. But as I said, for historians, this is not a problem most of the times. Uh, these are the this is a screenshot of the website that I show you at the beginning. Um, the Dewey classification for bibliographies is from 010 to 016. Uh, so this is where you, you want to look at. Uh, basically, at the library, uh, they are on the first floor um, by the, the, you know, the, the corridor of the president in the old side of the library. Uh, uh, I, 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 I don't know how to explain it better, but you know, we, we can point you to, to in, in the right direction if you if you come physically. Uh, so have a look into uh, um, into this classification to see if there is anything that might be of interest, and then you go on the library uh, catalog and look for bibliographies. But basically, yes, I don't know if anyone still does it, but um, uh, it's it's a way to look into old uh, old bibliographies that is very uh, that is very useful and you might not think of because it's not online, but it's actually, we, we still have them and it's actually there. Uh, 